Hello and welcome to another Pilates Hour and uh, so excited today to have a good friend of mine, many years and colleague, professional uh, educator and author. Many of you know Eric Franklin, the Franklin Method around the world. So welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us today in the Polestar Pilates Hour. Good to have you. Great to be here. And you're in Switzerland right now. Exactly. Not a bad place Same to lock your uh, well actually it wasn't it wasn't the worst place to be locked down because they got lots of lakes, you know. And they did let us occasionally jump in. Actually they, they fenced off Lake Zurich, <laughs> which is a first. I didn't think that would be but they, you know. Uh, but we, we we were able to like walk around a little bit and get a little fresh air, so that's good. They but it was tough. the beautiful summer in Switzerland. So that's yeah. That's good. Well, listen, we have an hour packed full of things, and I thought we would start off just with a little bit of reminiscing about how we met years ago and collaborated with iAdams and Advanced Medicine and your movement background and, and uh, the Franklin Method and it's from the United States and now everywhere in the world, the Franklin Method is well known. Uh, we have lots of guests on from around the world. I saw people coming in from Brazil and Europe and Asia. So all of them have experienced your work. So I thought we'd talk about that a little bit and then um, you, you put together a little bit of a presentation, which I think would be great to share with the audience. And then we'll okay. open up the questions uh, to you in the audience. Anytime you have a question, uh, feel free to write it down. And uh, Melissa, as always, will help us uh, work through those questions. And when we get to that point where we can answer those questions, we will do so gladly. So. Um, Eric, just first first question, um, just sort of thinking of, of your background of how did you, you know, we all know you dance, but how did you get into this level of understanding, you know, movement at such a deep level and coming up with your own method and, you know, we use your method all the time in Polestar, um, we encourage everybody to buy your books and um, not because we get any royalties on them, but because we feel like they're such great sources of imagery and teaching. So maybe share with the audience in case there's folks out there that don't know your background, a little bit about you know where you dance, where you train, and how you got into developing your method. Well, I, I was on a very intellectual track, so with university in, in Switzerland. I went to the same school, it's my bragging points that Einstein went to. <laughs> But, you know, it, that's the only school there, the only university, I mean, it's like, so that's not so special if you're in Zurich. Uh, and then I decided, though, I wanted to do something with movement, and I love to dance. So I went to NYU School of the Arts, and that was a long time ago. And um, that was wonderful, and still, you know, until my body started hurting, back, knees, you name it. And I sort of was thinking, well, dance is good for you, and it's so much fun. Why, why is everything hurting? And that's basically what started me out. So training alone doesn't mean that your body is going to be totally healthy but if you don't know how you're training. So that got me into anatomy and understanding how the body works best in any kind of movement. And... Uh, I also was in New York, so I explored every known modality uh, that there was, lots of somatic methods, hydrokinesis, yoga, you name it. And uh, I just uh, fell in love with, uh, you know, using the mind as one of the instruments to create change, not, not just your body. Because, you know, if you think of it, your daily life experience is how do you feel? How's your, you know, is your thinking quality, happy or whatnot, and you know, some other basic things. So I thought that's like the basis. And then of course, looking at the research, and there wasn't that much at that point, um, it was very clear that what is going on in your mind will affect very much how well you move. And so I looked at that relationship because that seemed to be kind of unexplored, uh, mentioned by many people, but there wasn't really much sign. So that's basically the process. And then I got invited to teach the American Dance Festival and for the Swiss uh, Olympic gymnastics team. And that's where I really learned most of my skills. 
So, you know, being in front of athletes and what am I going to do now? (laughs) You had mentioned idiokinesis and I know that you had dived deep into like Mabel Todd's work and, and other somatic leaders in the past. Any particular that you just felt like was sort of a, a mentor or a, you know, even if they passed on, just somebody that really was a hero to you in in the work that you've continued on over the last, you know, three decades. So yeah. uh, certainly, um, Andre Bernard, who was teaching at the Kinesis at uh, NYU, he was fabulous. But I had actually had a lot of dance teachers that used imagery really well. Many of them, for example, Kathy Ward, who was a fabulous. Um, you know, modern dance teacher, uh, and she used imagery all the time. I was like, whoa, the way she's cueing with imagery, how fantastic. And then a ballet teacher called Svi Gotainer, he was also great, his teaching style. So I just looked at what do I think is effective and helps me and other people. And so that a lot of that, um, I think, was how the whole method developed. And also, you know, there's certain people that are really good at cooking and, you know, other skills. I'm just somehow pretty good at imaging. I can just imagine things. And I think my other skill is I'm relatively good at figuring out how to help people move better. Um, I don't know. That's just what I can well, do. Other, other things I can't do so well. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you bring up this point. And I think you do it exceptionally <laughs> well. And I think that you know, using your imagery, your mm-hmm. uh, diagrams, the pictures that you show, uh, the, you know, the essence of what, you know, I've read Mabel Todd's work, and I didn't get the same thing out of Mabel Todd's work as when I read your work, right? So after after knowing your work and going back and looking at Mabel Todd's work, it made more sense to me, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, same with mm-hmm, Jesus' yeah. work. So a lot of it is being able to transfer that information that you do so well of, you know, again, it's the whole purpose of imagery. Like, how do you create an image that works for me? You know, I I, I can tell you many times I've had my set of images that I'm going to use. These images always work, and then you go to the client and they don't work. And you think, well, this client doesn't get it. That's like, no, I have to use different imagery. I have to, you know, be client-centric, not method-centric. And so you know, I do think that you have a gift at communicating how to use imagery uh, more than anything as a teacher to facilitate your desired outcomes. And I think that's why, you know, I'm so excited to have you on the webinar now because what everybody's struggling with, especially if they have a very strong tactile practice in Pilates and physical therapy, is that you got to be virtual and you can't do tactile teaching. You can't put their pelvis in the right place. You can't you know, move their feet or move their shoulders and head. And we felt, you know, very comfortable in Polestar teaching because we've incorporated so much imagery into the education. They've all read your books. They've all had their, you know, imagery lecture. They all get tested on using imagery. And it's made the difference night and day for somebody to be able to work virtually, like you said, using articulate words. And one of the things that I find challenging, I'd love for you to comment on, is when people don't use imagery that do not have accurate biomechanical and orthokinematical relevance. You know, you use an image that doesn't really line up with the body. And you hear people using it all the time. You think like, great image, but sorry, that's not how the, the brain doesn't work that way or the nervous system doesn't move that way. And you've done a very nice job of really doing your homework and exploring in your own body, exploring other people's bodies, looking at the anatomy, and then testing it. So I thought maybe you'd comment a little bit on, you know, how did you, you know, work, you've worked really hard to be able to get the anatomy and the arthrokinematics and the biomechanics to, to come together with the imagery that you created. Well, what I discovered was uh, just using imagery doesn't necessarily mean you're doing, you're being helpful. So. There were a lot of cues floating around that were simply anatomically incorrect. For example, as dancers, we were told, you know, to constantly lift your kneecaps. Well, sorry, if you bend your knees, those kneecaps have to slide down on the femur. There were, there's many, many like that. And so I said, I, you know, we have to clean this mess up. And so teaching, teaching people how to use imagery for cueing very effectively, it's an art in itself. 
because the thing about imagery is that you cannot see it like choreography. So you have ask someone to do a certain Pilates movement or yoga, you can see it, you know, you go, okay, that's not it. But with imagery, they're thinking it in their head. So it's a special art to teach people how to learn how to use their mind. And then the next step, once they get it in their own body, then how to cue more effectively. I think not all cues, because touch is touch, can be replaced with effective imagery. So if you know how to use imagery, you can really teach very well without any touch. And I do, I've been now since March doing a lot of webinars and we do a lot of movement and with a lot of cues and we do it with imagery. And there's different, you know, different kinds, metaphorical imagery, anatomical imagery, motivational, instructional. And so you sort of have a, a big, big toolbox once you're trained in imagery and then you just pick and choose what works with your client um, because you know the big problem in queuing is you demonstrate something you say something and it gets lost in translation so how do you get through I call it the black box right uh, how do you get through to your clients so they understand what you're talking about so teaching for me is not telling people what to do all the time it's helping people to have an experience of how to move more effectively they need to experience it once they experience it then you've been successful so i always say stop talking to people and give people the experience of what you're talking about and that you can do with imagery very well yeah that's great there's a, a couple of questions already that have come in okay right? um, they just wanted us to mention the name again um, early on we talked we talk about Abel todd Abel Todd was somebody in somatics in the early 1900s. Um, remind me of the name of um, person, one of the founders of Idiokinesis. I forget his name all the time. Um, well, the, the founder yeah. really was, was uh, yeah, Mabel, I mean, she was the first, Mabel Todd, yeah? And then afterwards came, you know, um, under Bernard and uh, Swigard and, and those people, Swigard also wrote a book, Bernard but you know, I have to say though, for today's standards, it is very outdated, yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah. so one of the things why I, I did what I did is, you know that in a class, in one of those classes, they never explained imagery. They didn't explain what imagery is, and that's one of the things, so if I'm teaching, and I have students say, oh, I use imagery all the time, my QA ask them, okay, so what is imagery? Tell me, what is it? And then they'll give examples, and I always say, how can you use a tool and you cannot explain what it is? And you can say what it is. So imagery is anything. It's quite an astonishing thing that humans can do that. It's the cognitive process of creating an experience in your mind that has right. a physiological effect, has an effect on your movement, motor and non-motor. So we know that imagery can improve strength, flexibility, force absorption self-confidence, motivation, there's research on all of that. So although they were pioneers, they used imagery, but they didn't teach imagery. I always say they didn't teach you what imagery is. We were using it as a tool. So, and that's, you know, then we developed the four steps, you know, so how do you, how do you teach people, you know, a new image and make it effective? So starting point, status quo, then what is your goal? then choose an image to create what you want to create. And number four, did that image work? So I created a lot of protocols. So the Frank Method, as far as I can tell, is the only codified and structured uh, technique for imagery that is evidence-based. Yeah. And that's why we should maybe look at the slides. And that I think will answer a lot of the questions and then go um, to more questions after that. Yeah. Okay, so here you, you have the definition, just, you know, the top line. So the Franken method, what is it? We also call it dynamic neurocognitive imagery in many of the research papers. is an evidence-based codified approach to use of imagery and body functional anatomy to optimize movement in you know, any modality. Um, so you can already go to the next slide. So <laughs> imagery has been around for a long time, just so we know. So no one around or even historical, we know, invented imagery. We've been using it forever. Uh, to improve our skills. So supposedly cave paintings were motivational imagery. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, exactly. So these are just some of our papers. Uh, look to the bottom right corner. That might be an interesting one for you, where we showed how you can improve hip flexibility and hip alignment, pelvic alignment with imagery. And the one on the left where you draw me a pelvis on the top there, that's about improving body schema. So body schema is just the you know fancy word of you know body awareness. And there's a very strong relationship between improved body awareness and better movement. So that's another thing I think a, a Pilates teacher should know how to improve body schema. I think because right. that automatically helps move. So, and we're very proud, you know, big announcement, da da da, bells and whistles and chimes and fireworks. So this just came out, thank you very much. This is the first ever paper on fascia and imagery. And it just came out uh, three days ago. So I made this paper together with Amit Abraham, Carlos Teck and Robert Schlack. And this is the beginning of the discussion on imaging fascia. So has never been looked at before. There's lots of imagery and muscle. This is the first right here on uh, imagery and fascia. And I last weekend, I just taught a uh, fascia training for the lower back and how to use imagery for your lower back fascia. So oh, I, I, Next it's slide. Slide. I know it's a slide. I was trying to scroll down already to read more of these. <laughs> yeah, no. So, so, so I don't forget to say it. Um, there's a link uh, that you will receive in the replay, I, I think, right? Correct me yeah. if that's wrong. And uh, there, there will be a link to an imagery guide where you'll have all the research links. Um, you'll have some free courses, like a free Improve Your Posture course, um, imagery videos, and we launched, of course, because of the situation, our first ever online Franklin Made the Teacher training, and you're gonna get a $200 uh, coupon for that uh, if you wanna come and learn all awesome. about what we do. Awesome. And um, yeah, so that's, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna get that, we'll make sure you, all the research links, so you can read all the papers. <laughs> good, good, good. So, as, so what is imagery? So here we see it. So it is a self-generated perception. So you can be lying in your bathtub and generating the image that you're floating in the ocean. Um, cool. You know, the sad thing though, is that a lot of people use this against themselves. You know, we're worrying, you know, we can't keep, pay this bill and like whatnot. And, uh, we can create all kinds of physiological frenzy just uh, through our thinking. So I try to keep this kind of like funny and fun a little bit. So this is just the list I mentioned before. Um, you know, if I, because people are not necessarily interested in imagery just like that. They want to be fit and look good or get rid of some pain, right? But if you say, if I would give you something or, you know, teach you something that improves flexibility, strength, stability, motivation, concentration, self-confidence, and it's free, always available, and adaptable to anything you want, would you want that technique? Would you want that skill? Everyone will say yes, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the thing is, that's not the problem. The problem is you do need to take time to learn it. Why is it a little harder than teaching choreography? Because we're all already using imagery, but random. So to learn about imagery, you have to be ready to change your mind. Because basically, a mental technique is trying out a new mind. Let's see how, you know, thinking like that works when I do this Pilates move. Let's and, try this other, you know, so it's changing your mind, yeah? Yeah, and Eric, I mean, I think, you know, could you think of a better time where we're forced to have to change our mind, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, if we're stuck in a certain mindset, I mean, now right. more than ever, we have to, prepared to change. I think that's something we've been trying to say in this webinar for the last couple months is it is time to pivot. And that pivot takes place in our perception, our beliefs, our choices. Um, you know, and that's why this is so empowering. We've, we've been taking a course on uh, mindset, you know, and looking at mm -hmm. how do we even get around some of the things that have been our blocks. And one of the key things that keeps coming up is you have to create a new image you have to mm. create a new vision. You have to create exactly. A you know that's right. why this is so powerful. If you don't know and, how and to people create resist picture. that so much, but you know, well, I think one thing we really nailed in the Franco method: we have an, a way 
to introduce imagery that's compelling and fun and you have an instant physical experience whoa that feels better because you got to catch people by I feel better now. I like imagery, you know, just like, oh, you should use imagery. And uh, no, I don't want to learn another technique. But if they have the physical experience, then, you know, they'll go, okay. And it's well, free and I can use it anytime. I'm getting this. Yeah. And, and I can tell you just from my <laughs> personal experience, I don't know when the, when was the first time we met back in, in Duke, I think, at one of the. That was, yeah, at the Adams Conference. Yeah. <laughs> I and that I was remember the second one class, ever. And, you introduced the pelvis and the and the bone rhythms of the lower extremity, and I was like, this, exactly. this guy knows what he's talking about. Let's get him over here. And so we were lucky enough to get you to come in and teach a full series uh, in Miami, which was great. But to this day, there's nothing more <laughs> impressive, there's nothing more impressive right. than somebody who thinks or believes that they have limited range of motion in a squat or a plie. Right you know running kind of movement and to be able to use the bone rhythms or to use the imagery of you know those arthur kinematics and watch the change immediately and watch them go exactly saw this whole paradigm shift of like right what the heck just happened to my tight heel cords what the heck just happened to my knee pain you know and being able to create exactly. that, that was that was really a, a, a transition point for me coming from the physical therapy world of thinking that restrictions were structural, not strategic. And there are times that we see structural restrictions, but of course, I think maybe 80% of the time it's strategic. So these type of skills empower all movement educators without a doubt. But the physical therapists also that think things are structural can realize very quickly with some of your methodology, Eric, that it actually is strategic. And by shifting the belief, the perception, the image, the schema of the body, very quickly you're changing the behavior, empowering the client to go, I just did that. I own that. I just did a plie with my heels down. I just was able to squat without my knees collapsing or without the telephemoral. So very powerful. I mean, this is, this is where I get super excited. So, so another interesting thing to say around that, you know, because it's a very, you know, we want things fast. Um, I always say the, the fastest way to change your movement is to change your mind. So uh, as soon as you think differently, you have synaptic changes and they haven't found uh, how fast that, I mean, it's, it's milliseconds. And all the other things are, you know, if you want to change muscle hypertrophy, collagen takes much longer, I mean, months. But imagery is really, really fast. And of course, it's not the only thing, you gotta move, you gotta do Pilates, you have to do that. But if you wanna get faster results and sit more safely, then it's it's definitely something that you wanna hone your skills in. And yeah, some people get instant results. And there, there are a few things you do when you introduce imagery just to show people, look, let's get a result like right now. And then they go, well, cool. And then they'll get probably interested in also maybe, you know, looking at some more challenging uh, changes because everyone has challenges. So the cool thing about imagery, you can imagine something that you can't really see or that, you know, is perceptively impossible. I mean, <laughs> uh, and there, the imagery can be inside or outside the body. You see the wheel there. I think that's one of the images that the, the world of Pilates has adopted out of the Franklin method a bit. And you know, this is just an example. Another advantage of imagery, you can have any perspective you want. So you can see yourself from inside or from the top or the side or whatnot. And there's a lot of research in this. Actually, you have another paper that's not published yet that addresses that. So focus, um, you know, and what does that do to how, you know, the movement changes, focus. Right, this is just showing, I mentioned that before. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine your pelvis as it is, or you can have, you know, some kind of magnet pulling on your knees. So um, it could be anatomical or metaphorical. And metaphors are basically borrowed experiences. So you've maybe experienced magnets, the power of magnets, and then you use that experience to uh, create an initiation in your body or an effect. Uh, the thing about metaphors is they're all very personal, right? So you have to know how to find the image 
the metaphor that works for your client. Left toe, the bone rhythms, you mentioned them before. This is just an example of pelvic counter rotation, right? Oh yeah, this is just to show, and you know, we do use instruments like bands and balls, but the thing about imagery, it applies to any kind of movement. So on the right, that's US weightlifting in Colorado Springs, um, where we worked a lot on uh, the pelvis, uh, you know, sacral nutation, because that's important, obviously, in a squat, and also shoulder movement. And on the left, that's the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. And they also um, had the experience of a Franken method workshop. So I just want to show it, it's not tied to a certain type of movement or age or, or problem. We did a very nice study with people that have Parkinson's. We, and we showed that you can help uh, people who have Parkinson's with imagery, so no pills. Uh, you can yeah. improve their body schema, their gait characteristics, and so forth. So uh, that's a very powerful sign that imagery can affect something. And I think that's the last slide. And so you know, that's interesting, Eric, that you mentioned that with Parkinson's disease, because right. a lot of times what we're dealing with is their automatic patterns are what are inhibited and rigid, right? But if they exactly. can create, like, a, if you if you gave them a command to step over a laser light, exactly, they can step over the laser light. So exactly. now create the image. Right. So if you find the right metaphor. Over. They don't exactly. need the laser light, right? But it's a metaphor because PTs would use yeah. the laser light to get them to initiate. But exactly. it's not like they can walk around with somebody doing a laser light to get them to step over. But they have the image now, the metaphor. Exactly. We've got a lot of comments that have come up, and let's hit a couple of these, and we can come mm -hmm. back to our discussion. Um, Ava says, hi, I'm so excited to join your conversation. I met you both years ago in Dusseldorf, Germany, and since that time, I'm always happy, and I could see some videos or attend workshops with you both. My question, what is the big difference between breathing in Pilates and breathing while doing Franklin method movements? <laughs> Eric, are you happy with all Pilates methods? Ooh, that's a... Interesting question. And then Brent, what are your experience with Pilates at school? Which age do you think would be good to start with Pilates? So we got four questions there. We oh, can start wow. with the first one, which is just breathing. And well, I, <laughs> what do you think? I think we all breathe the same, you know. Well, <laughs> I, breathing is breathing, you know, healthy breathing is healthy breathing, you know. I always have a joke. Somebody <laughs> comes to me and they say, I've been told I'm not a good breather, and I look down mm -hmm. and go, that's funny, you look like a really good breather, and they go, well, what do you mean? I said, well, most bad breathers are dead, and you're very much alive, so you're a good breather. <laughs> now, can we help you maybe breathe more efficiently, or can right. the breath be more interactive with your mm -hmm. movement? Yeah, we could help you with that, but you're a good breather, don't worry about it. But, but you know, one more thing right there, if you were to repeat what you just said, you're a bad breather, you're a bad breather, we're all bad breathers, a few more times, everyone watching this webinar, probably their breathing is getting tighter, right? You all can breathe, bad breathers, and we all feel, what, Have, you know? So, Don't these think words are powerful. If you say yeah. something like that, you're that's a cue, <laughs> yeah? I remember, don't think about pink elephants, you know, as soon as you create exactly. an object, we focus on the object. Right, Even if it's of course. Obviously, one can improve breathing, and actually one of the first things I did, uh, you know, when this all started, well, I did a bunch of free webinars, and I did a webinar on the rib cage and lungs to show people how just to use those more efficiently and more effectively, and just lots of things you can do to free up that whole area. Of course, you can do those kind of things. But I, I don't think, I don't think, uh, you know, to bring to the next question, um, what do I think about the different Pilates models? I would say, what do they think about me? <laughs> now, you know, I, I'm 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 big fan, obviously, of Pilates. I'm all for it. Um, and all I wanted to do in any time, you know, forever, was just to help people uh, do it more effectively, get more results, feel better while they're doing it. And then, of course, if someone says, "Oh, but that's," You know, that kind of, we don't think about that anatomy like that. I mean, I would debate it. You know, if you say, okay, knit your ribs or something or close your rib angle, I would say, well, yeah, man, if, if you flex your spine, but if you extend your spine, you know, then maybe you want to think the opposite. You know, just give it a try. You know, try to be, 
Well, and no, Eric, this this ties into what your you know what your work was with dance. You know, we had a lot of images that were not you know really healthy images for the body. You know, it's like the idea of spiraling the pelvis and the hips means that you're basically negating the hip mobility of that plie or exactly. of that osteo developing. So right. you know, if somebody tells us and I hear that, like pull up and rotate and spin Oof. the pelvis around and squeeze those glutes or touch you know, it's like all that right. language was such right. dominant language in the 70s well, and 80s. Yeah. Exactly. Well the the thing is that too. you know you can cue and it's it's based on function and you can corroborate what you're saying. But some cues, they sound intelligent and anatomical, but they're just downright going against function. Yeah. And, and it's like, if you then are, are looked at what well, you're criticizing, you know, and I, I believe in, I think ballet works. You can do ballet form with good function and have a longer career. So for just the, you know, there's many examples, but I taught at the Royal Ballet, the, some actual Royal Ballet dancers. So they're really, really good. And what do they want? It, it's very different from beginners They say, Number one, not to get injured, because that's the end. Number two, how to use our mind more effectively. Um, so teach us that. And then we have to look at, okay, are we getting information? Because cues basically are task relevant cognition. So information relevant to the movement at hand. And are we getting information that's anti-functional? And is that part of what's causing our problems? And if you look at the information, yes, you are. And, and yeah, dance is still a problem it, in that area. You know, I mean, a lot of this too is, you know, we have this mentality in Western civilization of fitness, right? So you mentioned right. earlier, you know, I want this tight abs, I want, you know, firm okay. steps, I want it, you know, this and that. Right. And not with this imagery of hard body rather than efficient movement. And, and we're coming back now full swing of like, look, I want to, I want to move efficiently. I want to move for a long time. I want to have good endurance. And the only way I'm going to do that is by learning how to move efficiently. And really what we should be teaching, right? And this is what the, you know, your work is so in depth in and what we do in the, you know, Pilates and Polestar, hopefully all Pilates, but we know that there's some Pilates is taught still with some very, old-fashioned cueing that could be improved if they would, you know, entertain it. Um, but the idea is that we are client-centric, not method-centric. The idea is how do we get that person to move more efficiently with the body? And right. one of the I love most that uh, you did, and, and don't um, judge me if I say it wrong, Eric, but it was the idea of um, ideal posture, where <laughs> body parts come as close to the central axis as the structure permits. So it meant that somebody with scoliosis could have an ideal posture, even if it's not the Kindle and Kindle posture of exactly. what a little right? right? Mm -hmm. Or the center of gravity. So somebody in a wheelchair could have an ideal posture for them in a wheelchair, or somebody with an amputation could have an ideal posture based on them. And I think this is where this concept of being client-centric or individual-centric exactly. and appreciating what does it take? What imagery can you use in that moment facilitate a paradigm shift and efficiency shift in their movement so that you know they're happier moving they're they're right. we need to move and if we move and we move with more efficiency we're going to get stronger we're going to naturally get more flexible we're going to have more activity we're going to be more sound in our mind and when we have thoughts that are like you know i need to get stronger i need to do this or do that it's like those almost work against us when we think of efficiency, it's a whole other exploration. And that's one of the the, the the challenge is, however, it's a hard sell. Because, you know, if you say, oh, I'm going to show you how, you know, toned abs, you know, like tight body and all that, easy sell. You come in and say, I'll, uh, you know, I'm going to show you how to be efficient. Not interesting. So I change it around. I say, okay, do you want your body to last longer? I mean, do you want to add some years to your physical longevity and feel really good? Yeah, yeah, I want that, okay. Then let's study efficiency. What is that? You have to 
turn it around. You have to find something they really want and say, Motivate. okay, and how do you get more efficient? Well, you got to understand your body and how it functions best in the kind of movements you do. Let's get at it. And when I teach the dancers, I, I, I never come in and say, I'm teaching you imagery. I ask them, okay, what do you want? It's dancer Christmas, anything you want to improve in your body. And then you hear the usual list and higher legs and this and that. Strong, you know, then I say, okay, let's get higher legs. And then I show them how with imagery like this, and then you know they improve, and then they're interested in the rest. Right, right. But first, you have to deliver um, within, you know, what the, the the client perceives it as he wants, and then they'll follow you to what you also see. This would be really important for you to like do a little organizing in in your body. So yeah. it, it's like with with imagery because um, you have to get people to be inspired about it, and then they will do it. Yeah, the motivation, we know that belief is the single greatest predictor of outcomes. So if you can shift belief or motivate through belief, then that's great. Um, the last question Ava had was just about schools. And, you know, I think that, you know, all of my kids were doing flies without knowing it from the time they were born. So it's <laughs> right? And it's mm -hmm. play, and it's acting right. like an animal, or it's, right. you know, doing things or competitions or climbing trees or running right. around on your hands and knees and things, you know, and hiding and, you know, all of those things naturally create. And we as adults look for something that's more structured to be able to act and play like a child. Exactly. And so just play like a child. And so I think in the school systems, I mean, we tried this years ago and it was very disappointing. We had offered to a whole school district free education to the teachers for the Pilates mat work with the videos for the mat work and even mats for the children that they could just plop a DVD in at those times and the children could drop down for five minutes of play doing some of the Pilates exercises. Of 3,500 school teachers, only two teachers had <laughs> free training. And the rest um, were asking, well, you know, do we get paid to go do the training? And it's like, no, you get it for free so you can help your kids, you know, when they get a little riley, you know, they just um, drop down on the ground and do a set of hundreds and some bridges and some roll-ups and, you know, pop charts. Um, next, next question. Uh, you know, I just want to say I also worked in schools. I also went into schools and actually directly I did like a movement during the break with the, but you could see it, it, it wasn't with the teachers and it, not so easy to bring that in. Yeah. It's tough. If you have a school teacher or a school that's really excited about it, I mean, we always have content to bring into them. And the only thing I have to do with kids is it needs to be age appropriate, and typically it's about play. So it's making it fun or a competition or um, working in pairs and doing things that are really fun for the for the children. And you know, I'm I have a 18 month well, a 18 month granddaughter who already is, you know. You got pictures of her doing like downward dog and playing and mimicking oh, her. Yeah, exactly. They do that at that age. Yeah. Exactly. Congratulations. Yes. Uh, Mikiko says, I want to learn the bone rhythms in Japan. Where should I go? Or are there any good books? Well, that's funny, right? I'll well, you can you can learn it. You can learn it in Japan, uh, you know, by doing the Franklin Method teacher training. Go to franklinmethod.com dash online level one you know go to our website we'll send you the link you can do it at home you can do it right there because yeah. right now uh it's it's a bit closed down over there so but online uh, level one is coming up and believe me we start with the bone rhythms you know on the first day <laughs> all right question from sarah could eric talk about any crossover with his method in feldenkrais please I believe they both have the underpinning of the soma and perhaps self-efficacy. Of course, I mean, you know, um, Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique, I've taught at Feldenkrais conferences, I've had a bunch of Feldenkrais people do my teacher training. I mean, our goal is all the same, right? And Feldenkrais is fabulous and all these, you know, mythologies, I'm all, you know, big believer. Uh, I think what's special, you know, you know, because about the Franklin method, gotta got have something special, right? Is that it's so adaptable. So um, we don't have a specific exercise. Okay, this is the exercise sequence you have to do, you know, this and this and this, uh, you know, to achieve that and that and that. So 
the Franken method can be done in any position, uh, lying down, standing up, sitting. Uh, we can adapt it to any kind of movement. So you can you can do Franken method within Pilates, within dance. Uh, and that I think uh, was important because I was thrown into all these different audiences and some of them uh, would have not, you know, want to do exercises on the floor or rolling like that, things like that. So you couldn't do that. So, and and this is just what some of the Feldenkrais teachers told me that in my training, and this is them. I didn't say that, so I'm not bragging. They said, um, with this, with the Rankin method, we can get the same results only faster. <laughs> so well, you know, thank you. But <laughs> you know, I think of I think of your method. And in no way belittling it, but it is a powerful toolbox for anybody that's teaching movement. And like, it's going to enhance whether I'm working with a golfer, or I'm working with a power lifter, or I'm working with a 90 year old that wants to bend down and get a great granddaughter out of the bathtub. You know, it, is, it is a toolbox that is essential in human movement. And I think, you know, what I would, I would ask the question differently is like, is there any human who couldn't benefit from, you know, imagery and these tools? to be able to have better quality movement? And the answer is no. And I think that's, you know, therefore, you know, I always have found it that I can apply it in my physical therapy, I can apply it in my tonic, I can apply it in my Pilates, our running training, we use it a lot in our running training um, yeah. of imagery and even the evolution of it. I think once you taste it, once you, uh, you know, have it made accessible to you, that then your creativity continues to blossom based on the clients you're working with. So I find that I create imagery based on my imagery not working for another client and I have to be creative and find another way. It's a very creative thing. It improves your cognition and we know that. So if you teach imagery or use it in, in, as a, you know, a cueing modality, you actually you're training your brain because if you imagine something you're using more of your brain than if you actually would see it. So you're getting like a free side benefit right. of, of you know mind rejuvenation if you're doing imagery and what, what you're you know experiencing is that you get very creative and the images pop into your head when you need them for the client and it sort of becomes a little bit like magic the right things come into your mind at the right moment yeah. but it's training because you've been doing it now for so long you know yeah. um aaron says i find imagery help uh, helps break down barriers with tough clients who don't want to think that hard or aren't emotionally connected, especially when you use humorous imagery. Pelvic exactly. mutation is one of the most life-changing revelations for me as a back and SI joint pain sufferer. What is an image for pelvic mutation that you have used? Well, there's 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 so many. I mean, a whole bunch of them. <laughs> the whole bunch of them, exactly. Uh, yeah, you might pop up some slides. Uh, there's endless amounts of things you can do for that yeah but you know probably shouldn't do an anatomy lesson right now because it gets a little bit too much but and um, I'll, I'll come, and, you, come and join one of the webinars or courses and i actually did one on the sacroiliac um that yeah like a month ago i did a sacroiliac webinar so it's it's on our website so i mean yeah. this is you know, the pelvis and the, the lumbopelvic region is such a powerful area in your work, mm -hmm. you know, as all the body, but you've definitely, you know, spent a lot of time in the power of the pelvis. And I think that's the other thing, too, is one of your books. I mean, you have a book just on pelvis. I think that's a good read. And we'll, we'll send you a list of Eric's books. And um, you can definitely order those anywhere. We'll, we'll, include, we'll include it in our, our you know, Franken Method, yeah. Welcome to Imagery Guide. So... Just get that and we'll have the research and the books and the whole thing there for you. Yeah. And so Paula asked if we could talk about bone rhythms. We don't really have a lot of time to do it. And right. uh, but again, it's sort of along the same line. It's a very fundamental uh, you know, aspect of Eric's work and understanding in a way that patients and clients can understand it. So you know, a lot of times we can get so technical in arthrokinematics. I mean, it's, it's arthrokinematics. Right. But it's arthrokinematics made available. So, exactly. Uh, so it's it's basically just the, the way the bones and joints move to create safe, you know, natural and safe movement. And we teach it through imagery, and it's based on biomechanics, of course, and 
people have, you know, experiences of spontaneously more freedom in their joints like that. Uh, and so it's a learning process. So if you're going to help people, you have to have a nice step by step process for them to start experiencing these things so they move better you know i said at the very beginning people like to feel good and if you if you're moving more efficiently and more freely you feel better and that's you know what the game is about your daily life experience is how do i feel and how do i think and if if your thinking is positive and you feel good in your body things are good so those are the two fundamental skills to give your client uh, yeah. through Pilates or any other modality of that. We could do a quick little exercise for everyone, like a feel-good exercise if you want to do that. Do we have time for that? We have too many questions, um, right? We might have, um, I got like three or four. Yeah, we only have seven minutes left or something, yeah. So, I mean, what I would suggest is, I mean, you know what sticks out of my mind, Eric, because I'm sitting thinking in my head of the knee, you know, like spins back, glides forward, loudly. So All that, like that, yeah. You know, and going through, you know, the idea is the pelvis spirals out, the femur spirals in. Exactly. And that the pelvis is, you know, pelvic bones are a spiral. Right. And yeah. it's, you know, it's in my, you know, it's in my DNA at this stage of the game. <laughs> of course. Understanding how that works. And then diving in deeper to look at really the arthrokinematics at a very deep level. Understanding we're just allowing the body to do what it's supposed to do. It's like, don't get in the way of it. Don't try to tell somebody to contract their VMO to be able to do, you know, don't get the muscles in the way of what the joints automatically do. So to me, the bone rhythm was such a nice revelation of saying like, look, let's get away, you know, from trying to tell a muscle to work. Exactly. Let's tell a muscle to work with a task or a concept of how the bones move. That's what the bone exactly. rhythm is. So right. if the bone moves correctly, you know, and that, that was just a, a great, you know, revelation and movement. Um, well, it, it is it's easier for people to learn in the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Marwa says, I'm someone that's pretty lordotic. I'm great mm -hmm. in back bends, but often get told specifically to tuck my ribs in during back bends. Right. So me behind that cue to support a movement with its opposite action. Would you consider that wrong and or inefficient? Question for Eric. Well, I'm, honestly, I'd have to see you do the movement. Yeah. I, I I don't know. I don't even like to use the word wrong, you know. I just, I would like to say maybe you have better options or maybe there's another option you want to explore that actually works better for you. Things like that, yeah. Because wrong is a big thing, you know. You're doing that wrong, you know. I mean, if you, if you think that in your head, if you move and you think I'm doing this wrong, like even if you just lift your arms and I'm doing this wrong. You'll be tighter in your muscles. So um, you're not doing it wrong, but maybe you have more effective, healthier options to explore. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, Rose said, hi, Eric. Can you um, describe and give an example of motivational imagery? I'm assuming it's meaning um, using imagery to motivate a client to do something or do it doesn't mean to experience and discover on their own. Thank you. Well, you, you just wanna you wanna give them the experience that uh, if you use a motivational image, it's a little bit easier to move, most likely. So you could say, everyone, you know, you think I'm so happy today, and lift your arms, right? I'm so happy today, and then compare that. I feel really sad, you know. Today, you know, a lot is weighing down on me, and then lift your arms. And most of you will feel the arms feel heavier, right? That's an example. Or another one would be um, reach forward with your hand. Um, <laughs> this is a, you know. And now uh, when you reach forward with your hand, a thousand dollars will fall into your hand instantly. <laughs> and many of us will go, okay, that, that's fun, you know. It's a motivational image, right? Um, so it's just something that makes you more excited about doing the movement or more happy about doing the movement. Um, there's many uh, examples. I, I remember one, I think it came from you. <laughs> right. And it was one where we were imagining that if you had to go like 10 miles on foot, <laughs> right. and the end of the 10 miles was a $100,000 check with your name on it. And then it was, 
Now imagine the same 10 miles if you had to write a check for $100,000 for somebody else. What's the motivation <laughs> in the movie? Like, exactly. I don't care what I'm wearing, I would run for 10 <laughs> miles, even though my body's broken and somebody says, I would get there for that $100,000 check. But to write the check, my knee hurts, my back hurts, I can't do it right exactly. now, I'm busy. Yeah. So, all, all well, the way. that's the thing is we, we are so good as humans um, creating, you know, physiology just with our mind. I mean, let's, you know, stress is probably one of the main reasons behind so many diseases, yeah. and stress is a thing you're generating in your minds. I mean, if there's no saber-toothed tiger walking into your room where you really should be stressed, that isn't happening, uh, you're just worrying about bills, but you're having the same effect, then, of course, it's your mind. And you can you can teach people how to really change things around up there. And as you said, a lot of people move much more officially very fast. So another question? That's yeah, we lots have, fun. Uh, there's a couple that are asking what's new and also what sort of motivated your work looking at imagery and fascia. There are like two or three questions with similar. <laughs> well, I've, I've been working with fascia and imagery before fashion, you know, fascia was popular. I've been working, you know, you can see in my, my books, I have examples, 1996 of fascia, just no one was really interested yet at that point. And there's so many great things you can do, uh, you know, through imagery for your fascia. It's, it's fantastic. And especially together with muscles and uh, we've been exploring that in great detail. Yeah. So how, what are the images that change that physiology that you can use when cueing fascia. Um, it's it's very exciting, and especially you know, the nice, systems together. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about that, you know, like with Robert Schlepp's work and, and the mm -hmm. team you've been working with, um, you know, the science is, is catching up to what, you know, people were, who were thought of being way outside of the box. Um, exactly. Years ago, now the, you know, the studies are there. And you think of you know this living, dynamic, ever-changing tissue that's filled with Golgi organs right. that has everything to do with uprightness and posture. And you know as we start tapping into that imagery and that communication, and also knowing you know now I think they showed uh, that they pulled living fascia out, put it in a dark room that emitted light for up to like well, yeah, hour exactly. Hour. You know, it's filled with like photons. So it is a communication system. It doesn't only go into a cell, it goes into the nuclei. Exactly. So all of a right. sudden now, if you can tap into that, and you've been using the imagery of it forever, but the idea now really justifying it through the evidence base is that, you know, you really are tapping into real structure with real communication. Exactly. It's much faster than the nervous system. But, but you know, in Pilates especially, uh, obviously, there's also meningeal fascia and there's uh, the organ fascia, and that that's one area that a lot of I think a lot of teacher can you know still explore. And I did at the the last uh, PMA or the before last I remember I did a very popular workshop on on organs in in Pilates, and so there's a lot of fascia there. You have a fascial skeleton, and so there is so many possibilities. To create more ease of movement, more comfort, to get more out of the exercises you do uh, with fascia, and so we're exploring that. We're looking at the science, and we're developing imagery all the time, and we, we teach it in our in our teacher training, of course. So we're about out of time. All right, mm -hmm. but I have a good question. Deb says, "Do you provide adaptation for people with osteoporosis in your work?" And do, do we provide anything here? That one any kind of modifications or adaptations. Oh yes, yes. We, we, with osteoporosis, and we've had uh, people with a variety of conditions um, do our training. So our training, there's no prerequisite, you know, that you have to be in perfect health or totally fit. So it's really anyone can do this, and we adapt uh, for you, and we make it work for you for sure. Mm -hmm. There was yep. a comment from Alexander from I Adams. This is great to listen oh. to the conversations between the two of you. Thank you from Alexander I. Adams, program committee chair. As sports scientists and strength coaches become more integrated in a powerful force in the dance, medicine, and science world, how can we further help to integrate these cueing, imagery, neuroscience techniques into the practice over more pure, typical strength training? Which, you know, I mean, this is 
That's music to our ears, Alexander. Of course. <laughs> just, you know, you know, just we can do it. Just like give us the opportunities to present these to the, you know, appropriate groupings, uh, to the to the teachers, to the people who run these schools. I mean, we've just heard, you know, I teach at Juilliard. So I've been teaching at Juilliard for 13, 14 years, right? Um, and they've been very open to that and other universities as well. But we've just had one more university, the UArts, which is now going to run a Franken Method program for dancers. So we need more opportunities to show dancers that they can have, you know, avoid injury, improve their technique, feel better, be more confident if they learn how to use imagery. And I have very specific classes for that. I have one called the Art and Science of Plié. And a long time ago, I taught it at the Adams when I was there last time. And uh, the teachers really appreciate it. So more of that, and uh, I think we'll start to make a difference. So, so one more comment here, and then I think we're going to wrap it up with your final mm -hmm. comments, Eric. But Adrian says, Franklin balls have been amazing for my clients, especially helping them to find greater movement with ease. Mm -hmm. Are there tutorials on the website to learn more about how to use them? Um, there are, and in fact, I mean, it's not set in stone yet. I'm going to do a webinar, free webinar, uh, on how to use the balls because there's been so many requests. So, you know, what do you do with all these things? So, stay tuned. If you if you join the the link, um, and then we'll we'll send you the information on the free webinar and show you how to use <laughs> all these different things, right? Um, we use them all the time. We love them. Yeah, this one's a lot of fun. This one's great for fascia. Because you see, it doesn't just roll. You can like grab the tissue, and you can do a nice little z. And it's these these spikes are not bad at all. Nice soft ones. So this one, for example, is really really good for fascia. You know, this spiky mini roller. We it's air filled, and yeah. So there's going to be a free webinar on that. So uh, what was it again? I said it a few times, but uh, join the you know frankenmethodcom online level one come to that or look at the link tomorrow and we'll send you all that information. Well, as one who's gone through your training years ago and I know you've updated a lot of things, it has been you know, completely absorbed in Polestar culture and we're forever grateful for your influence. Thank you very much. We appreciate it very much. Um, Eric, um, as we come to a close, anything that uh, it could be philosophical, it could be with the world crisis, it could be COVID, or it could just be a simple um, you know, closure, but something you'd want to share with the people that are with us today? Well, if you you know want to change your body, first change your mind. <laughs> um, yeah, attention is the beginning of change. Um, you know, your flexibility is only as good as your posture permits. I mean, there's I have a lot of aphorisms <laughs> like that, and things that we say like, you know, uh, you know, embodying your function improves your function is one of the classic things we say. But, you know, the thing is, no matter what's going on around us, we can always create our own life, our own little, you know, sometimes we need that little bubble of feeling good and having happy thoughts. And it's a training. It's not, I'm not saying it's always easy when, you know, things are challenging, but you can train yourself Okay, I'm not. I'm going to have a healthy body within all of this, uh, and I'm going to use the skills that have been given to me and built into my system. You're always having your mind with you; it's always there, you know. So, sixty thousand thoughts and images a day—that's a lot of opportunity to yeah. imagine something useful. Even yeah. just walking down the road, you know, thinking of your feet being flexible and fluid and wind blowing you forward and you know all kinds of you know head is a balloon and and i do that a lot in daily life i just think things as i walk along uh to you know feel better and that practice makes you a better teacher as well because you're more skilled at at making yourself feel better and then you know how to also help others better it's it's for all of us yeah, yeah so thank you very much uh, hey eric you know, you, you mentioned wind, and here at South Wind Farm, the retreat center, <laughs> right. I'm just curious to the audience that if Eric and I got together and did a retreat for four days, how many of you would be interested in coming to visit us at the farm? 
and uh, let us know. We might. We were trying to do something in 2020 that obviously got kiboshed. <laughs> uh, but it's very likely that you know we can do something in 2021 or soon after that. And, that would be uh, fantastic. I would love to do that. Fun. Yeah, that's yeah, it. that's so, the plan. Okay. So we'll we'll play and see if we can get something together like that. That would just be a real you know journey. So. Um, Eric, thank you so much for joining us. As I mentioned, um, Eric, when we send this out, uh, his links, his uh, discounts, the activities that Franklin Methods and all around the world will be sent to you. So please take advantage of it. We strongly advise that as one of your you know, most important tools in movement teaching and rehabilitation. And then I also want to bring your attention to Saturday, um, Polestar is having an, another Polestar experience online. And there's still some spaces available for it. It's a sliding scale. So we usually ask $200 for it, and it gets down as low as $60 based on what you can afford for uh, being able to work with people like uh, 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 Alexander Bolander from Germany, working with Elise Becker from Brazil, Christy Idaboy from, uh, from, uh, from Costa Rica now. She obviously moved from Miami down to Costa Rica. We miss her in Miami. And also Frederick Curry from Rutgers is going to be doing sort of integration of Bartinia with Pilates. So some really fun um, activities on Saturday. And again, you can just go to you know the Instagram for Polestar Pilates International, and you can get the link there to sign up for that if you're interested. Um, next week, I'm going to be doing a webinar on pain and understanding um, pain better and being able to help our clients by shifting imagery and working with some of the standings as well. So um, look forward to seeing you guys hopefully on Saturday and if not on next Thursday. Eric, thank you again. And we will put something together in 2021. I'd Good luck to new adventures. Yeah. I can't wait to read yeah. the new article. And uh, we'll see everybody later. Be safe, be sane, wear a mask. Thank you. Be safe and healthy. Bye-bye.